Hello and welcome to this new course unit. In this module, we will review some tips for writing an applied economics paper in the field of development. The ideas presented here were prepared by Sylvain Desi, a full professor in the Department of Economics at Laval University. You will find the list of references at the end of the presentation. For this module, we will briefly discuss what an economic research paper is focusing exclusively on applied economics research. Then we will share insights about what it takes to write a good economics research paper. The targeted audience for this module is primarily scholars interested in development research. Most examples will be drawn from empirical research papers, but the content can easily be applied to applied theory or CGE modeling papers with a minor twist. Let's start with a question. What is a research paper in economics? An economics research paper is a story about how you uncovered a socioeconomic relationship previously unknown or not well understood. A carefully structured written diagnostic on the causes of a socioeconomic problem along with a prescription for its elimination or reduction. In other words, an economics research paper is not just about the story of what you have uncovered, but also how to properly structure this story to make it accessible to others. Of course, how you structure your written story depends on the category to which your story belongs. Let's now look at the different types of research papers in economics. Not all research questions in the field of development require the same analytical methods to uncover answers. Indeed, economic research papers are either theoretical, empirical, or both. The type of paper you write will depend on the question you are interested in and whether data has or can be collected on your topic. Therefore, depending on the research question, one may use one empirical methods using observational and field experiment data to obtain causal inferences, or two, quantitative methods, such as computable general equilibrium models and calibration and numerical simulations of theoretical models, and finally, three, theoretical methods. In between these three main types, you have papers that combine theoretical and empirical methods. The key difference between these paper types is how they try to answer the research question. What is the motivation for writing a research paper? After you have asked a research question and found a convincing answer to it using scientifically proven methods, you want to tell others that you have found something of value, something that adds to existing knowledge. In the field of development, Adding to knowledge often translates into new policy insights on a specific phenomenon. What do these two statements tell us about the motivation for writing a development paper? They tell us that you can communicate your research findings to others, describe the process leading to these findings, show others the validity of your findings, and inform development policy. It is important to keep in mind that people do not want to read your paper unless you convince them to. This makes the description of the process leading to your paper's result all the more important. In particular, an economic research paper is structured to convey the point the authors are making as soon as possible. Otherwise, readers lose interest. What is the structure of a research paper? By structure, we do not only mean the paper structure, that is, the title, abstract, introduction, or literature review, data, empirical strategy, main results, robustness tests, and conclusion. That's relatively easy. What I mean is, what do you put into that mechanical structure? In other words, how should each section of your paper be structured? After you have finished your research, you will be happy to have found something of value, and there is so much that seems important. So how much of what went into your research should enter the story of discovery you want to tell others? At this point, it is important to point out that too much information and unnecessary detail can be an irritant because most readers are impatient. To get people to become interested in reading your paper, 
you might have to ask questions like the following when thinking about its structure. What if I only had one sentence to describe my research and results? What goes into such a sentence? What should I leave out? And if I only had a paragraph, what should it contain? You should write your paper with the answers to these questions in mind. This is precisely what gives the title of the article and its abstract such importance. Unfortunately, many writers tend to take the title for granted and do not include it in the logic of the pair of questions we just raised. I should also mention that the structure of the paper, as described in this slide, offers a more general format. It can be adapted depending on the type of methodology used. For example, for an empirical paper, you will want to divide the section on conceptual framework into two sections, data and empirical strategy. For a theoretical paper, the conceptual framework is basically the description of the model. For a CGE-based paper, the conceptual framework involves two sections, the description of the SAM and a model simulation framework. I will come back to this issue further below. Given the caveats discussed in the preceding slides, here's what I consider to be a standard structure of an economics research paper. It should include the title, the abstract, an introduction, a conceptual framework, the structure depends on the type of paper, the results, and concluding remarks. Let's start with the title. Most readers are inclined to judge a book by its cover. They tend to infer the importance and interest of a paper based on its title. These two facts imply that your title is the first point of contact with readers, and you want that first contact to be a success in terms of getting a priori uninterested readers to become interested in your paper. If readers find your title interesting, they are more likely to infer that your paper is too. To get them interested in your paper, you should first and foremost make your title informative. A good title is an answer to the following question. What if I had to describe my paper in only one sentence? I am sure that most of you would agree that this is indeed a tricky question to answer. Because, after spending months and months trying to uncover the answer to your research question, time spent designing and often refining again and again, your statistical or theoretical inference procedure, you have perhaps too much to talk about. Yet talking without listeners is in vain. Therefore, it is fair to say that in a free academic world, readers are like kings. Authors thus ought to serve their readers' interest with due diligence or risk their papers being thrown away. That said, let us come back to our tricky question. How can I describe my paper in a single sentence? Well, here are some basic principles. First, do keep in mind the primary function of the title is to provide an accurate summary of the article's content. That means the title must tell the reader what your paper has researched and concluded. Second, a good title should contain your findings. That is primarily what the readers want to know. Third, it should also give a glimpse of your methodology. In other words, it should relate a cause to an effect through some method. Obeying these three principles will make your title informative as long as it is concise. Too long a title can make its content ambiguous and challenging to decipher. Therefore, I would add a fourth principle based on a large sample of titles from reputable economics journals. A good title should contain a maximum of 12 to 13 words. Let us see how we can distinguish a bad title from a good one. Why are some titles wrong? Let's look at title A. First, if it is too long. This one has 16 words instead of 12 or 13. Second, it lacks clarity. In reality, the author is interested in the relationship between the agricultural cooperative model and technology adoption among farm households. But in the title, the author also suggests he is looking at many determinants of technology adoption among farm households, which is a little bit confusing because agricultural cooperatives are one such determinant. The third problem is that, although the research question can be inferred from the title, it is too specific. 
It suggests that a relationship between agricultural cooperatives and farmers' technology adoption decisions is only relevant in Zamunda. What about in other countries? A good research question should be more general, even though its answer may be context-dependent. Title B has all the information contained by Title A. It is more direct, precise, using fewer words, and consistent with a general research question. Here's a practice question on how to title a paper. You're given a short abstract of a written document and asked to formulate its title. In thinking about a title for this document, keep in mind that a good title must be short, no more than 13 words. Describe the research question, for example, what the paper's about, indicate the methods used to answer the research question, and give a hint of the main finding. A good abstract offers a window into your paper. It allows impatient readers to take a peek at your paper and decide if it is worth reading, sharing, or citing. Indeed, most readers are fundamentally impatient. They are busy. They have a specific idea of what they are looking for and do not want to waste time looking for it. Most readers want to know your main results. Only if they find that result interesting will they care how you arrive at it. So what is an abstract? There are probably many ways to answer this question, depending on who you are asking, but here are a few common points. An abstract is a quick overview of the research paper's content, enabling readers to know precisely what the paper is addressing, a window through which readers can peek at your research work, a concise representation of the entirety of your paper. David Evans of the Center for Global Development has an interesting perspective on how to write a compelling abstract for your development research paper. You will see the reference to his piece at the end of this PowerPoint. It is freely available online. I encourage you to read it. Basically, Evans starts from the viewpoint that readers go to the abstract to decide whether your paper is worth reading, even though most journals only allow authors four to seven sentences to state their full abstract. The challenge here is to be concise yet informative. So how do you make your abstract compelling? It must contain your research question and a brief statement defending its relevance. It must give a snapshot of your conceptual framework, and it should contain a concise description of your key findings and what they mean for policies. Once you know what goes into your abstract, the next important step is how to organize your ideas in it. Here are some more insights from David Evans. Often, start directly with the research question and conceptual framework. Sometimes, start with one sentence of motivation before jumping into the research question and methodology. Almost always spend most of the space on a concise discussion of the results, and sometimes include one sentence discussing the results' implications. Here is an abstract of a development paper that I would like us to use as an example. Of course, Zumunda is not a country. I use this fake name just for fun. Can you tell if this abstract is well written based on the structure discussed in the previous slides? The idea is to spot what is good and not so good about this abstract. In particular, to analyze this abstract, think about the structure suggested by David Evans, but also the length. Let us start with what is good about this abstract. It contains the research question. The impact of participation in an agricultural cooperative on adopting agrarian technologies. It summarizes the methodology. Uses the two-stage estimation method based on cross-sectional data of farm households to account for potential selection and endogeneity bias. It presents key research findings. Also, this participation of farm households promotes their adoption of improved seeds and inorganic fertilizers. It offers concluding remarks. Particular emphasis must be placed on agricultural cooperatives development if we want to promote the adoption of farming technologies in Zamunda. There are, however, quite a few irritants in this abstract. The author allocates too much space for a discussion of his methodology. 
He starts with, this paper uses the two-stage estimation method based on cross-sectional data of farm households to account for potential selection and endogeneity bias. Then he goes on to describe the two steps involved. In the first step, a probate model is estimated to determine the factors that explain the participation of farm households in an agricultural cooperative. In the second step, a multivariate probate model Notably, he chose to emphasize an intermediate result rather than the key result. The results show that factors such as the number of cooperatives and the location of seed acquisition explain farm households' participation in an agricultural cooperative. Another problem is the use of the passive voice. A probate model is estimated. A multivariate probate model is applied. The use of active voice is strongly recommended to give a clear idea of what the paper does. Last but not least, this abstract is too extended, 179 words, it can be brought down to fewer than 150 words by keeping the discussion of the methodology more concise. Here is an example of a good abstract. It is taken from a paper recently published in the Journal of Development Economics. As you can see, it starts directly with the research question, gives a concise summary of the methodology, then allocates ample space for the discussion of key findings. Because it explains the consequences of a violent conflict, the policy recommendations are obvious. They don't need to be stated. Stop the conflict or risk compromising the quality of your future labor force. And it is less than 100 words. The next step is to write the introduction. Again, most of the discussion here draws from David Evans' perspective on writing the introduction of a development paper. It is included in the list of references and I encourage you to give it a look. With most developmental journals introducing a pre-screening stage in the review of the submitted manuscripts, it has become obvious that you can win or lose readers, including journal editors, with the introduction of your economics paper. Research cited by David Evans shows that economics papers with more readable introductions get more citations. So if the abstract is the window through which readers can peek at your paper, the introduction is the entry door to it. Unless you keep this door wide open, you won't get many people to read, share, or cite your paper. Basically, the introduction is a more detailed abstract in which you lay out your research question, your empirical strategy or theoretical model, your findings or results, and why they matter. To sum up, the introduction is the door to your research paper. It tells the reader why the issue you studied is interesting, what you did and how you did it, how what you did relates to policy, and how it adds value to the literature. The structure of an introduction is likely to vary with the type of paper. For example, whether the paper is an empirical, a theoretical, or a CGE paper. However, in general, the structure of the introduction looks as follows. Motivation, one paragraph. Research question, one paragraph. Conceptual framework, one to three paragraphs. Main results, three to four paragraphs. Value added relative to related literature, one to three paragraphs. Roadmap, one paragraph. Of course, this only gives you the introduction layout, which is a little bit like a bookshelf with many compartments for storing different books. It is important to know what book goes into what compartment if you want to keep your bookshelf well balanced and make it inviting to avid readers. Likewise, with the introduction of a research paper, it is important to decide what type of information goes into each paragraph, how much of it to put in there, and where to place that paragraph in the introduction. The goal is to help readers come away from your introduction with a clear idea of why they should be interested in your paper, about what you did in it, what your findings were, and how you built on the work of others to, to create your own work. Again, just like the abstract, the introduction is where you can win or lose readers. To know how to motivate your paper, you might want to start by addressing the following question. 
How do I convince readers that my topic is important? To help you answer this question for your paper, I will share some examples of how answering this question helped others motivate their papers. Let me start with example 9.5. This example is derived from the first paragraph of the introductory section of James Fenske's paper published in the Journal of Development Economics. He motivates his paper by first stating the social problem underlying his study, polygyny. He then uses the literature, albeit implicitly, to tie this social problem to a well-known economic problem, poverty and other equally serious socio-economic ills, thus establishing the importance of studying it. So how do you convince readers that your research topic is important? For James Fenske, it is by stating the socio-economic problem underlying your study and defending its importance. Fenske is telling readers that unless this problem named polygyny is solved, or unless the reasons why women marry polygynously are understood, we might not be able to eradicate poverty or boost, sa boost savings rates in affected countries. That's a powerful message, one that impressed referees and the editor of the Journal of Development Economics, leading him to consent to publish the paper. Of course, not all research papers are motivated primarily by a specific socioeconomic problem. Example 9.6 tells us that one can also motivate his or her paper by establishing an important debate or puzzle in the literature. This is precisely what Rachel Heath does in her 2017 paper published in the Journal of Development Economics. The debate she is contributing to centers around the relationship between motherhood and labor force participation among women. Her contribution to this debate is to explore the role played by the social context of women's labor force participation. A few papers skip the motivation to start directly with a research question, particularly in other fields of economics. However, development economics is usually about interventions aimed at eradicating problems. Hence, the importance of starting with the motivation and then moving to the research question. Readers want to know what your paper does, so that is precisely how you will state your research question, by saying what your paper does. This information can come at the end of the first paragraph of the introduction, or better, it can spearhead the second paragraph. Be as straightforward as possible when stating your research question. Keep in mind that a clear statement of the research question enables readers to gauge the research added value to the literature. Here are a few examples of well-stated research questions. The first comes from Seema Jayachadran in her 2006 paper published in the Journal of Political Economy. The second example is from a 2019 paper by Pauline Rossi published in the Review of Economic Studies. Finally, there is also an example from a 2021 paper by Natalie Bao published in the American Economic Review. This is where you explain concisely how you answer your research question. These are not all randomized control trials. In the field of development, there are two main groups of studies, micro-level and macro-level. Whatever the type of study you conducted, it is important to state your approach clearly. It can be a micro-level empirical study using observational data, cross-section or longitudinal, or a macro-level CGE analysis of a given fiscal or environmental policy. To best summarize your conceptual approach, whatever the type of study, you want to explain how you're going to answer the stated research question. Are you testing a model? Are you evaluating a program or a policy change? What data are you using? For example, in an empirical paper, state your identification strategy. You want to state and defend your identification assumptions, if you have any, and you want to anticipate all the important problems confronting the use of that identification and show how you solve them. You will be given excerpts from the introductory section of a paper and asked to formulate the question underlying the research conducted in that paper. This example is drawn from a 2021 paper by Natalie Bao 
published in the American Economic Review. This example is drawn from Taryn Dinkelman's 2017 paper published in the Economic Journal. This example is drawn from Peter Nykamp et al.'s 2005 CGE paper published in Economic Modeling. This example is drawn from Richard Akrush's 2019 paper published in Economic Development and Cultural Change. Akrush acknowledges concerns about his empirical strategy and indicates what he did to assuage these concerns. This example is drawn from Taryn Dinkelman's 2017 paper published in the Economic Journal. Dinkelman indicates how her identification strategy minimizes concerns that confounding factors may drive her results. Not only does she anticipate a criticism that might be directed at her study, but she also demonstrates that she took care of that concern. In doing so, she raised the reader's confidence in the validity of the results she finds. To state your results, think about the answer to the following question. What exactly did you learn from this research? The answer to this question is important because readers should be able to cite your paper after they read your introduction. Therefore, make it easier for readers to cite your work. State all your important results and discuss their importance. Most published research papers dedicate a substantial portion of their introduction to the results or findings, often three to five paragraphs, or between 25 and 30 percent of the entire introduction. Both of these examples are drawn from Bertoni et al.'s 2019 paper published in the Journal of Development Economics. The value added is what your paper contributes above and beyond the existing literature. You probably didn't invent this topic of study. Good for you if you did. So it is important to position your work relative to previous evidence. This section of your introduction should basically consist of two parts, both of which should be brief. First, discuss previous research that is directly relevant to your paper. We insist on directly relevant to your paper because readers want to know about your research, not that of others. The review needs to be topical and include research that employs the same methods you are using, analyzes a similar model, and uses the same data set, etc. Second, explain how you contributed to this literature. Is it new data? A new model? A new identification strategy? A new data set? Are you answering a classical question more broadly or specifically? If so, do your findings differ from the existing literature, and how do they? In most published articles, the bulk of that discussion comes towards the end of the introduction. Keep it concise and directly relevant to your topic. The point of the introduction is to introduce your work, so don't make readers wade through paragraphs of other people's work to get to it. This example is, again, drawn from the 2021 paper by Natalie Bao, published in the American Economic Review. This example is drawn from a 2017 paper by La Ferreira and Melazo, published in the American Economic Journal of Applied Economics. After the literature, the next section of an economics research paper usually focuses on the conceptual framework. The structure of this section depends on the type of research paper you are writing. In applied theory, the conceptual framework is a theoretical model, for example, micro or macro. In CGE modeling, this framework includes the description of the data set, for example, the social accounting matrix, and the baseline model underlying the simulation exercises. In contrast, in an empirical paper, this step consists of describing the data and the empirical strategy. In CGE modeling, writing the conceptual framework involves two main steps. One, the description of the social accounting matrix, SAM. Two, the description of the SAM-based general equilibrium model. 
The SAM is often viewed as both a data gathering framework and an analytical tool for studying the effects of various macroeconomic policies. Basically, it is a popular tool for mapping production and distribution at the economy-wide level. In describing your SAM, specify the sectors. For example, is the informal sector accounted for in your SAM? Describe what is new about your SAM. For instance, is it the level of disaggregation? What is unique about it? And describe the endogenous and exogenous accounts and their level of disaggregation. For example, how are households classified in the household's accounts? How are these accounts disaggregated? At the national, regional, or sub-regional levels? The CGE model explicitly simulates the behavior of every actor represented in a SAM. It specifies a parameterization of the relationships described in a SAM. Therefore, in describing your CGE model, make sure you specify whether the model is static or dynamic, and you specify and discuss the assumptions underlying the parameterized relationship between endogenous and exogenous variables. Are production functions Cobb-Douglas, CES, or Leontief? Are products homogeneous or differentiated? And describe the simulation design. What are the main behaviors simulated by the CGE? In an empirical paper, writing the conceptual framework also involves two main steps. One, a description of the data, and two, a description of the empirical strategy. It is important that every part of your paper supports your story. This includes the data. Describe the data you are using, where you found it, what variables it contains, and any other characteristics of interest. This section also usually contains two parts. The first describes the name and source of the data you are using, the period it covers, and the key variables that are measured. The second part presents relevant descriptive statistics of the data you are using. The best way to describe your data is to read empirical papers published in top journals to find out how they did it. Basically, you want to tell readers where your data comes from. Did you collect the data? Does it come from a conventional source of data such as demographic health surveys, DHSs? For example, if it is survey data, it is important to give the year the survey started and the year it was completed. It's also important to describe the types of data used, whether you have a panel, cross-section, or time series, what the observational unit is, and how many observations you have. Discuss limitations of the data such as missing variables, missing observations, survey response, a small number of observations, and other obvious shortcomings. In particular, you may want to highlight the important limitations such as those that you might address in a falsification or robustness check later. To do that properly, it is helpful to think about the ideal data set for the hypothesis you want to test and compare your data to that perfect data. It is important to explain how the data relates to your hypothesis and note any problems they pose. If you have only a small set of observations or have to use proxies for data, you cannot directly observe, it is paramount to acknowledge it explicitly. Readers appreciate honesty and are more likely to trust your results if you give them all the information they need to assess them correctly. Descriptive statistics are an interesting way to test your data's ability to corroborate the story you are telling. It is often handy to organize your descriptive statistics into a visual test of your hypothesis. You may start by presenting a couple of tables with means and standard deviations from your variables of interest. This includes all the outcome variables, your regressors of interest, as well as controls. To get your data to reveal your story, it might be helpful to present these descriptive statistics for different subgroups. For example, treatment versus control, pre-reform versus post-reform, etc. Another way to organize your descriptive statistics into a visual test is to use graphs or charts. In this example, 
we describe a visual test of the hypothesis that early childbearing increases within couple gender gaps in earned incomes. This is based on ongoing research by Sylvain Desi, Anna Lucia Kassoff, and Luca Taberti. Their data for visual test comes from Brazil. They build a sample of married or cohabitating couples and compute the household income share accrued to the wife. We divided the sample into two subsamples. One contains married couples in which the wife becomes a mother before the age of 18, early childbearing, and the other consists of couples in which the wife became a mother later in life. For each subsample, they plot the distribution of the wife's share of the total income earned by the adult household members, for example, the husband and the wife. The left panel represents the distribution of the wife's share of the household income among married couples in which the wife experienced early childbearing. And the right panel represents the corresponding distribution for couples in which the wife did not experience early childbearing. On each panel, the vertical line touches the x-axis at the point where the wife's share of the household income equals that of her husband. In other words, this is gender equality in earned incomes. The wife's earned income accounts for 50% of total household income. To the left of that vertical line, a wife earns less than her husband, while to the right of that vertical line, she earns more than he does. Now back to the visual test itself. Does early childbearing increase the within-couple gender gap in earned incomes? To answer this question using the figures shown on this slide, we compare the shape of the distribution on the left panel with that of the corresponding distribution appearing on the right panel. The first remark is that both distributions of the wife's share of the household income exhibit a right tail. This implies that most married women in our data earn less than their husband, irrespective of their childbearing status. The second remark is that the tail of the distribution on the left panel is flatter than the one on the right panel, as indicated by the respective fitted yellow lines. This implies that compared to married women who had their firstborn child after 18, married women who experienced early childbearing are less likely to earn more than their husbands. This remark indicates that our visual test supports the hypothesis that early childbearing increases the within-couple gender gap in earned incomes. The insights on how to describe your empirical strategy are drawn from a paper written to this effect by Plemon Nikolov, 2013, a development and labor economist affiliated with the State University of New York at Binghamton. This paper is cited as a reference at the end of this PowerPoint, and I strongly encourage you to read it. In your empirical strategy section, you want to tell readers how you estimate causal effects related to your hypothesis. This section is the heart of an empirical economics paper. Indeed, having set out your A causes search question, reviewed the existing literature, explored the theoretical perspectives of this question, optional, and describe the data you will work with, you are finally ready to do some analysis. However, before performing this analysis, it is important to lay out your plan of action for readers to see. This will help them understand your research better. This is the section where you write your baseline econometric specification, explain each of the variables and the parameters of interest, discuss the strengths of this specification and its relevance for the research question. In so doing, keep in mind that the most important thing for an empirical work is undoubtedly the identification of your hypothesized causal effects. Where is the identification coming from? OLS, IV, RCT, others? What are your identification assumptions? In addressing these issues, you want to set up a compelling argument about your strategy in identifying the causal effect of interest. Various identification strategies allow you to estimate causal effects, including OLS with exogenous variation in X, instrumental variable estimation, difference in difference estimation, 
regression discontinuity designs, randomized control trials. Be clear about what specific identification strategy you use. Tell readers how you applied the particular method you chose in your context. Do not turn your results section into a kitchen sink. One of the more common mistakes made by authors of economic papers is to forget that their results need to be written up as carefully and clearly as any other part of the paper. There are essentially two decisions to make. First, how many empirical results should be presented? And second, how should these results be described in the text? An excellent general rule is to present only parameter estimates that speak directly to your research question. Here's a more detailed layout of this general rule. Present re results in a way that develops your arguments step by step. Main results including falsification tests. Break these results into subgroups, for example, by age, region, area of residence, Present robustness tests results. In presenting the results tables, clearly state the dependent variable, included controls, and the specification. Report standard errors. Discuss the statistical significance of the results. Interpret the estimated parameters and their magnitudes in an economically meaningful way. What if your paper is essentially theoretical? It is common practice to show results in the form of propositions. Here's what I would suggest as a structure for the results section in a theoretical paper. Present your results as propositions. Each proposition must contribute to the answer of your research question. State your proposition in plain language. And explain how these propositions answer your research question. Convince readers that X causes Y highlighting the mechanisms at work, and discuss the implications for public policy. Concluding your research paper is really optional because readers will not wait until this last section to know what question your study was trying to answer and what you found as an answer to this question. However, it is customary for authors of economic research papers to offer concluding remarks as a way to close their papers. Indeed, scholars think that including a conclusion in your research paper can remind your readers of the strength and impact of your findings. Conclusions can also serve as a basis for continuing research, creating new ideas to resolve an issue you highlighted in your paper, or, or offering new approaches to solve a problem. For these reasons, your concluding remarks should be explicit and sum up what you have presented in your paper without sounding redundant. Avoid adding information to your conclusion not shown in your paper. That said, how do you structure a conclusion? There are many perspectives on how to do so. Mark Belmare, a professor at the University of Minnesota, has a blog offering a formula for writing a conclusion. It is listed as a reference at the end of this PowerPoint. You may want to Google it. In terms of structure, when writing your conclusion, consider taking the following steps. 1. Summarize. By that, I mean to restate your research question. Remind readers what was key to the answer you gave to your research question. Summarize your results, but do not restate all of your findings. And state the significance of results and state the significance of your results. 2. Discuss the limitations of your study. What could you not do due to limitations imposed by your data? And 3. Give takeaways in terms of policy implications of your study. What does the answer you gave to your research question mean for public policy?